guys, welcome back to Empower In. My name is Caroline Porter Thomas. Thank you so much as usual for watching my videos. So in this video, we're going to go over a disease process that you will see a lot as a nurse no matter where you work, and that is called diabetes mellitus. So just like the other video, what we're going to do is instead of doing NCLEX style questions at the end of this video and making a super long, overwhelming video where we all feel very rushed and we're not able to fully answer the question, as we finish editing the questions, we're going to post the questions individually. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and also sign up for email updates so you get updated immediately. So without any further ado, let's get started and let's go over diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus. Metabolic disorders that are associated with high blood sugar and glucose are collectively known as diabetes mellitus, which you will see abbreviated as DM. Reasons for high blood sugar level can be too little insulin produced by the body or the body's cells that cannot respond to insulin properly, or it can be a mixture of both. Most of the ingested food is broken down into sugar known as glucose, which then goes into the bloodstream and acts as the major source of energy in the body. It allows the body cells to grow and sustain, but in order to enter the cells, glucose needs a hormone which is known as insulin, which is produced by the pancreas. Every time we eat and food is broken down into glucose, the pancreas reacts by producing insulin according to the level of glucose in the blood. Insulin then carries the glucose from the blood into different cells around the body, reducing the level of glucose in the bloodstream. Generally, concentration of glucose in the blood fluctuates between about 70 to 110 in a normal individual. Diabetes mellitus occurs when the pancreas does not produce sufficient insulin or the cells do not respond to the insulin. In both cases, glucose stays in the bloodstream due to which not only the levels in the blood glucose stay high, but also the cells do not receive sufficient glucose. These conditions manifest symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Initially, cells lack sufficient fuel to sustain, but prolonged periods of high blood sugar results in organ failure, in which major organs such as heart, kidneys, eyes, nerve cells, and blood vessels can be damaged or fail to function eventually. There are three types of diabetes mellitus. Type 1 is when the pancreas cannot provide sufficient insulin. This type of diabetes mellitus is considered an autoimmune condition, as the patient's body destroys its own beta cells in the pancreas that are responsible for the production of insulin. As the pancreas is unable to produce insulin, type 1 diabetes is managed by injecting insulin to maintain normal blood sugar levels, which is why it is usually referred to as insulin dependent. It is also usually referred to as juvenile onset. About 15% of all diabetic patients have type 1. In type 2 diabetes is when the cells do not respond to insulin properly, leading to what is called insulin resistance. The cells do not use insulin properly, so sugar levels in the blood stay high, causing the pancreas to produce extra insulin to compensate for the resistance. But the cells continue to developing further resistance and eventually the pancreas fails to produce sufficient insulin to meet the body's requirements. This condition occurs in people that are older than 30 years of age and is linked with obesity in 80 to 90 percent of the cases. And the early stages of this type of diabetes can be controlled by proper diet and physical exercise. Patients may also need medications like insulin and metformin to reduce the level of glucose in the blood. About 85% of diabetes patients have type 2. Type 3 diabetes. This is called gestational diabetes and is the third type. Gestational diabetes occurs during pregnancy in females. In some women, the concentration of glucose in the blood is relatively high and their bodies do not produce sufficient insulin, due to which most of the glucose does not enter the cells, hence keeping the blood sugar levels high. Generally, this type of diabetes is managed with appropriate diet and regular exercise, but in about 10 to 20 percent of patients may require some type of treatment to maintain blood sugar levels. If gestational diabetes is left uncontrolled, the patient may face complications to the infant, both in gestation and at birth. The newborn may also be larger than normal. Signs and Symptoms Signs and symptoms are almost the same for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. There are three typical symptoms. They are polydipsia, which means an abnormal thirst sensation, polyuria, frequent urination, and polyphagia, which means excessive appetite. When the cells cannot use blood glucose due to insufficient insulin, 
They survive by breaking down the fats from the cells. This mechanism produces compounds known as ketones. Although cells obtain energy from ketones, but it also makes the blood highly acidic, hence resulting in the condition known as diabetic ketoacidosis. This condition then generates certain symptoms as well that includes nausea, vomiting, deep and rapid breathing, which is also known as cushmol breathing, fatigue, weight loss, abdominal pain, and the smell of acetone in the breath, and a bad taste in the mouth. Normally, ketosis is observed in type 1 diabetes only because in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas produces insulin and some amount of glucose manages to enter the cells. However, level of glucose in the blood still stays much higher than it should be, which which can result in extreme dehydration. This condition is known as non-ketonic hyperglycemio-osmolar syndrome. It produces symptoms such as drowsiness, mental confusion, and possibly seizures. Complications. All types of diabetes mellitus are associated with long-term complications that usually develop over a period of 10 to 20 years. The severity of the risk depends on how long the individual has had diabetes and also how it was managed. Affected areas include the blood. Patients become very vulnerable to infections, particularly in the skin and urinary tract, which can be spread through the blood. And once infected, it can become very severe much easier, and it takes much longer to overcome any infection. The skin can also be infected. The skin can develop ulcers and can slow recovery from wounds, which can cause infections, especially in the legs and feet. Slow or almost no recovery from wounds leaves amputations as a last resort. The blood vessels are also affected. The blood vessels are affected due to poor blood circulation, which also means slow recovery from wounds and hence susceptibility to infections. It can also result in heart attack, stroke, erectile dysfunction, and gangrene of the hands and feet. Diabetes can also affect the kidney by causing renal dysfunction and eventually kidney failure. The eyes. The eyes are also affected, causing decline in eyesight and eventually leading to potential blindness. Nerves. In many cases, the nerves are also affected, causing a gradual or sudden weakness in the legs, altered sensation, tingling, numbness, or pain may be felt. Diagnosis. Diabetes mellitus is associated with hyperglycemia, that can be perpetual or reoccurring. There are certain tests to detect hyperglycemia that include the following. An oral glucose tolerance test. This is when the patient has to fast for the night prior to the test, after which his fasting blood sugar level is measured. Then, the patient is given a particular glucose solution of a standard high concentration to drink. For the next two to three hours, the blood sugar levels are checked tested and recorded periodically. Fasting blood sugars can also be used. For this, patient has to fast the night prior to the test and in the morning a blood sample will be drawn and tested for hyperglycemia. Glycolated hemoglobin is also known as hemoglobin A1C, is a test under high concentrations of glucose. This test is used to measure the amount of blood glucose that attaches to the hemoglobin molecule and the results can provide information about the patient's average blood sugar level over the past two to three months so it's much more accurate. Management and treatment. Treatment of diabetes is focused on controlling blood sugar levels and maintaining it within a normal range. It is achieved by monitoring the blood sugar level, modifying the diet and exercise, and medications or insulin when necessary. These measures control the blood sugar and reduce the risk of complications or at least delay them. Lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes include physical exercise and appropriate diet. The suggested diet should keep blood sugar levels low and it should be intended for weight loss. It is found that a low glycemic index diet helps maintain blood sugar levels. Physical exercise also prevents obesity as well as controls blood sugar levels. Exercise can include aerobics, such as dancing and walking, or resistance training, such as yoga and weightlifting. It is more effective to perform a combination of several different exercises instead of only one type. About 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercises most days of the week will be quite effective. However, it initially can be started light and be intensified over time. Insulin replacement. Almost all diabetic patients with type 1 and some with type 2 diabetes need insulin injections. These injections are injected into the fat layer under the skin, usually in the arm or thigh or abdominal wall. Insulin cannot be taken orally because stomach acids destroy the insulin. 
Types of insulin. Fast-acting insulin. Fast-acting insulin, after being injected into the subcutaneous fat layer, is quickly absorbed into the bloodstream. It is helpful during snacks and meals to prevent elevated blood sugar levels. There are two types of fast-acting insulin. Rapid-acting insulin, which starts working 15 minutes after the injection and in about one hour reaches its peak and remains effective for two to four hours, it is used in conjunction with long-acting insulin. Examples of short-acting insulin include insulin aspart, which is also known as Novolog insulin, and insulin Lispro, which is also known as Humalog. Regular or short-acting insulin, after injected, normally enters the blood in about 30 minutes, and it peaks in about two to three hours, which is when the injection reaches the optimum activity. It'll continue to work for about three to six hours. This type of insulin can be injected prior to meals. Examples of this type of insulin include Novolin R, and Humulin R. Intermediate acting insulin. This type of insulin lasts longer and they will take longer to be absorbed in the bloodstream. That is about two to four hours after the injection. It reaches its maximum activity after about four to 12 hours and continues to work for about 12 to 18 hours. It can be used between meals while fasting or overnight. It is sometimes used along with rapid or short acting insulin. Examples include Novolin N or NPH, and humulin N, long-acting insulin. Long-acting insulin absorption time for this type of insulin is long. It enters the blood after many hours of injection. Its peak activity is also minimal, showing a steady plateau effect that remains throughout the day, which means it works slowly and evenly, reducing blood levels over a 24-hour period. Long-acting insulin can be used between meals, while fasting, or overnight, along with rapid or short-acting insulin. Examples of this insulin include Lantus and Levomir. Premixed insulin is a mixture of intermediate acting and short acting insulin solutions, which is generally injected prior to meals twice a day. It is meant for individuals who cannot read dosage and directions or who are unable to mix solutions themselves. Antihyperglycemic drugs. Patients, especially with type 2 diabetes, can take antihyperglycemic drugs to control blood sugar levels. These drugs do not help type 1 diabetic patients but can lower blood sugar levels in type 2 diabetic patients to a significant amount. It is usually given to these patients in cases where physical exercise and dietary changes fail to lower blood sugar levels sufficiently. These drugs come in tablet form, and tablets are taken orally before or after meals or as suggested by the doctor. Examples include metformin, actos, precos, and genuvia. Monitoring treatment. Monitoring treatment includes keeping a close check on the diabetic patient's blood sugar levels. It is the most significant part of management and treatment of diabetes. Diabetic patients should change their eating habits and diet. They should also exercise regularly and take insulin or medications on time to avoid high blood glucose levels. Keeping a checkup on blood sugar levels helps to understand the changes required to maintain a normal blood sugar level. With the help of monitoring devices like continuous glycose monitoring systems and glucose meters, anyone can monitor their blood sugar level at home or anywhere else. All right, guys, we really hope that you enjoyed that video. Like we mentioned before, make sure you come back frequently because we're going to be posting nursing exam style questions, which are also known as NCLEX style questions, as we finish editing them. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We are super excited to do that for you. So we can't wait to see you again soon. Love you. Bye.